Okay, so welcome to the fifth and final lecture in The Rise and Fall of Christian Civilization. This one is entitled The Age of Secularism and the Crisis of Modernity, and we will see why in just a moment. So when we last left off in the previous lecture, we were talking about how the Reformation fundamentally did two things in, in transforming or beginning the transformation from Christian medieval civilization to modern secular civilization. And the two things it did were, one, it disrupted at, at the fundamental level the whole idea of Christianity as a singular, coherent thing. It, it, it's proliferated thousands, hundreds of thousands, well, tens of thousands of denominations now, about 30 to 50,000 by most estimates. So thousands of denominations of Christianity essentially pushing Christianity out of any, any voice in culture or having any shared religious culture among Westerners, period. That was all cut off. And the second thing it did was it kind of created this opening for the rise of the nation state and the nation state as the as state absolutism, as the absolute arbiter for all values, for having power in a way that was unchecked by anything else, including and especially the moral authority of religion. So that's where, that's where we come into the age of secularism. Now, what happens when you eject uh, theology from the center of your culture, when you say, okay, this theology that gave us all of our moral values, that shaped mankind uh, in, in, Western, in Western civilization, when you reject that, then you need a source for values again, right? Because you can't just have values hanging out with no basis. Uh, that's just fiat or consensus. You need something more than that to truly ground values. And we saw that in the rise of Christianity amidst the pagan world. These values like universal human dignity would not have arisen if it wasn't for Christianity introducing these new paradigms about human beings, about persons, and all this kind of stuff. And it grounded those values in the very nature of reality itself, in the nature of God, in the nature of being. Excuse me. When God is a person, then your people, when, when Christ becomes incarnate, then everyone has radical human dignity, and so on. Well, that's why there begins this quest for secular morality, meaning some basis on which you can ground all the nice ethical statements that people like in Western culture, but you want to ground them in some way that's independent of theology. And this leads to all kinds of different philosophical attempts to do so, uh, and that's, that's, we're going to cover that in another lecture that just focuses in on uh, the age of secularism in its philosophical shifts in detail because there's a lot that happens. There's a lot of players in that conversation. But the main one is utilitarianism. I don't know if that's worth writing on the board. Utilitarianism is just this idea that you need to, that the ultimate good is defined as maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain for the greatest possible number of people to the greatest possible degree, basically. And that sounds good on paper, but it, it can't, it's unable to actually solidify itself as an absolute value in the, because it's not grounded in any, anything metaphysical or in any, in any value. Let's say it's not grounded in any way that makes it anything more than the state says so, or the consensus of the people has sort of agreed upon that. And the reason with fiat and consensus as your grounds for value is because they are arbitrary, definitionally. They, they can change. They're not, they're, not grounding, uh, they're not grounding stakes into metaphysical reality the way that the ancient Christians would have said, this is good in an absolute sense. Consensus fiat, not good in an absolute sense. Okay. Let's, let's call that entire movement, though, the Enlightenment. So the Enlightenment comes out of, comes out of and let's, let's put it at, you know, this is like 1700s, 1800s kind of thing. That's where it starts. So this period is characterized by this attempt to find secular morality, some, some way of grounding morality not in religion. And the answer that they, they attempt to go forward with is reason. There must be a rational ethics, they say, that anyone who exercises reason can figure out 
on their own. We don't need to appeal to any authorities. We don't need to appeal to any complex theologies. We don't need to appeal to any particular religious way of viewing the world. If everybody's just reasonable and rational and we can work through all this, then we can arrive at a purely rationally, let's call it a rationalistic morality or a rationalistic standard for moral values. And they came up with many of them. Utilitarianism is one of them that has its own problems. But there's, a, there's an incredible amount of optimism and enthusiasm for this project. They think, and it's framed around a certain notion of freedom. That's what I want to say here. So sort of the rallying cry for, I'm going to put this in quotes, the rallying cry for the Reformation, uh, in the words of Immanuel Kant, was think for yourself. Dare to think. Sapere uh, aude, right? Dare to think for yourself. And he meant we need to stop listening to all the moral authority of all these priests and churches and all this kind of stuff. You need to think for yourself. And if you do, you'll discover within yourself uh, a human reason that everyone is endowed with and that you, we can all access. And then we will all be able to arrive at, at, a, at a purely rationalistic grounding for morality. This, of course, necessitates that they paint the previous ages with a kind of revisionist history where we think about those ages, i.e. the medieval era, as an age in which people didn't think for themselves. They just mindlessly obeyed the church and they mindlessly obeyed priests and, and that's what caused all of these problems. When, of course, if you listen to the previous lectures, you would know that the wars of religion weren't the result of the unified Christian Europe, they were the result of that unity breaking apart and then there being no moral authority to stop all of that from happening. So it's kind of a projection of the early modern Reformation drama, let's call it, onto the entirety of the Christian era in Europe, which is not fair, as you know. But they have a special way of thinking about freedom. Freedom is kind of the ultimate value uh, for the modern world which you know because you live in it. Now, here's the thing about all of this. It all sounds very nice. and Everybody was very optimistic about this project. Of course, the idea was that you know, as, as reason becomes more of the center point, something that we can all share regardless of religion, it'll lead to more and more technological improvements. And then technology will sort of create this utopian reason-based reality, this, this, this way of running society that's all, that's utopian with science and technology and rationalism, and we can discard all of those weird dogmas of the past and move into a new age. It's very triumphalistic, uh, and it has this kind of, like I said, revisionism about history and about Europe's own past. The problem with all of this is that it breaks down pretty quickly. In just a few centuries, all kinds of things happen that kind of prove that this project doesn't work at all, and that the attempt to ground morality in a purely rationalist kind of framework uh, doesn't, doesn't prevent any of the horrors that happen in the next three centuries, which you should know about. So just a few highlights. We can't, obviously can't get into all of it, but let's call this, because, um, you know, industrialism. I mean, this is a big umbrella that I'm making here, but, you know, the age of expansion. So all the nation states, they go out, they conquer Africa, there's, there's the, the return of chattel slavery, which is very, would have been sort of very bizarre to the medievals, I would think. Because remember, slavery was a feature of the, Medi of the ancient world, the pagan world. It, it weakens and almost disappears in the medieval world, in Christian medieval world. And then it returns with the rise of modernity and the, and the age of conquest and the age of exploration of all the European powers. And, and then, of course, industrialism has all of its own horrors uh, and exploitations and stuff. And... Here's an important point. People want to look at this part of history and say, aha, you see, these Western values are horrible. Western civilization is based on exploitation and, and imperialism in the sense of dominating all these other and enslaving all these other cultures. And they want to identify this as Western civilization's heritage. But you must understand that this is not the authentic heritage of the West in the sense of the ideas that gave it its fundamental identity. This is what happens when that identity starts breaking down. In other words, when the theological center for, like none of this happened for a thousand years, uh, but when, when the theological center of a united Christian worldview that places, as we saw, 
all this dignity on the human person, the universal dignity, when that breaks down and that no longer has a seat at the table in how to run our society and it's just the nation state unbridled with no moral checks and balances on it, we get this. So this is actually the result, this, this is actually the result of the breakdown of Christian and Western values, not, uh, not them in their full bloom, let's put it that way. And all of that expansion of the different nation states across the rest of the world, the era of discovery and all of that, inevitably pits the nation states against each other because as each one grows and each one conquers and absorbs more power and influence, then of course they run into each other. And then which of the nation states is going to be supreme? Because we know now, by now, you should know by now that the nation state as a model, the secular nation state, has sort of this unbridled appetite for its own sovereignty, its own will, its own power, and it couldn't bear or tolerate the influence of the imperial system or the moral, moral authority of the church, and of course it's not going to do well when it gets confronted by other nation states. So of course that leads to the world wars, and the world wars, let me just write this, so the world wars, uh, and, and, of course, the whole chaos of the 20th century and the, the, the sort of almost infinite murder and bloodshed, this has to be understood as the result of this story, which is the nation states butting heads with each other and going to war on a catastrophic scale with one another that, that would have been unprecedented in the ancient world. And here we need to pause again and remember that it's not, because cynical people, and I appreciate cynicism to a certain degree, right? Cynical people will say, well, the reason that the brutality and the savagery of the world wars was unprecedented is because we simply didn't have the technology in the ancient world to do that sort of stuff. And if we did, you know, people are awful in every age, and they would have just done it. And I don't think that's fair. I think that's very anachronistic. I think that projects our values and our sensibilities onto the past. And here's what you have to understand, too. The technology didn't exist prior to this. When the nation states came into conflict with each other, there was an acceleration to develop this technology for the purpose of dominating one another. World War I began with guys on horses and sabers, right? Like the good old days. And it ended with tanks. You know, there was a massive drive and a push for technology to create all kinds of new, un unprecedented ways of, of savagely murdering people. Tear gas, is, tear gas and trench warfare, and then later, of course, napalm and the atom bomb and all this kind of stuff. And I don't think it's clear that none of that, that, that technology would have been developed anyway. Uh, let's say if the medieval, the sort of fundamental social, political, cultural structures of the medieval world continued into into the 20th century. I don't think it's clear that those people would have developed that technology for these reasons. One, because the motive isn't there. There's no need for all this, this crazy nation state infighting uh, because there would have been a united Christian culture across, across Europe. But you, know, you, you could make all kinds of arguments and hypotheticals about what if there were other enemies and so forth. But the moral quality of that period is really what I'm appealing to. I'm not saying it was a perfect moral moral culture, let's say, but you know there were, for example, there were days of the year in which it was the church forbade people to go to war, and people didn't, and that even happened in World War One. If you if you read books like uh, like All Quiet on the Western Front, you know on Christmas there, there's just an understood ceasefire. People just stopped doing that, and that's that's a relic of the old Christian order that existed for a thousand years in which people understood like you gotta you gotta honor these religious feasts and you might that might strike you as hypocritical but you know it's a hard tension that the church fights with culture which is people do bad things and hurt each other that's just a norm across across time but at least in the middle ages there was this powerful force saying hey can we not do so much of that and in modernity, that's completely absent, really. Not that, not that religious figures didn't express their reservations about this or that, but nobody listened to them. I mean, ultimately, we still, we still committed all these atrocities. And, and one other thing I should mention here is that there, 
there was always going to war in Christian Europe in the old days. It was always understood that you didn't do that lightly, that there was a real concept of a just war and an unjust war, and, and theologians and, and bishops and regular people were, were keen to make sure that when they did go to war and they, have to, they had to do that thing, that that was a last straw, or that was something that you had to do very carefully and intentionally and make sure it was a just war, not an unjust war. And there's a lot that was written about that in the Middle Ages, and people took it seriously. Obviously, not everybody did. Corrupt people who didn't care what the church thought and didn't take it seriously. But there was a real effort to take those kinds of values seriously. And one of them, and part of that, let's say, included included a regard for civilians. You didn't just slaughter civilians for no reason. But, but in the wars of the 20th century, slaughtering civilians is the main way that you try to bring an, a rival nation state to its knees. You bomb London to, to hell if you're Germany, for example. You drop an atom bomb on Hiroshima if you're the United States, right? And then and then Japan surrenders because it doesn't want its entire civilization wiped out. I mean, we're not talking about a difference in technological ability. We're talking about a fundamental paradigm shift in the way that war is conceived of and what's permissible and moral in war. Because, again, even though medieval man was no, was no better a moral specimen, perhaps, than, than man in any other age, there was at least a a moral and theological power or presence in the culture that really made people think about and, and put parameters around how they engaged in conflict with each other. Obviously, if the church had its way, excuse me, that Christian values in medieval Europe failed to produce an entirely peaceful and loving culture is not the fault of Christianity, it's the fault of people because obviously if you know anything about Christian theology, that would be the ultimate goal. Uh, and so that it failed to enact that is a shame, but it's not, it's not because Christianity didn't try to do that. But on the, on the secular nation state, there's absolutely no reason to do that. You must, you must defeat your rivals. And if that means bombing and slaughtering civilians or rounding your political enemies up into death camps and concentration camps and then slaughtering them with systematic scientific precision, then that's what we're going to do, ladies and gentlemen, because the nation state is the ultimate and final arbiter of truth and value. And we kind of see the same pattern in the different atrocities that were committed in, in the world wars and in the 20th century, there's a correlation between all of the nation states that most thoroughly reject Christian values, most explicitly reject Christian values, and the ones that commit the greatest atrocities. So take Nazi Germany, for example. They're explicitly trying to create a new moral system you know, whatever the church in Germany said about it is irrelevant. When you, when you actually read the, the Nazi kind of ideology, it's about creating a new set of moral values uh, for Europe, often centered around, you know, eugenics and all this kind of stuff. It has this whole, the Aryan race, the destiny of mankind. None of those are Christian values, obviously, because they make a separation between uh, people who are worthy and people who are not. In other words, not everybody has radical human dignity on on Nazism or any of the eugenics projects. Remember, eugenics is a huge topic in the 20th century. There are American eugenicists who want to exterminate black people like Margaret Sanger. There are Nazi eugenicists who want to exterminate the Jews. Uh, this happens all over and, and our country is not uh, not immune to any of, the, of these temptations. And of course, the whole eugenics project itself is a great example of an idea or, or a philosophy that would have been inconceivable to our Christian ancestors because, of course, they believed that all human beings were equally in the image of God and endowed with equal human dignity. So the idea that we need to sterilize or eliminate bad specimens to sort of produce a new human being is, is something that they wouldn't have been able to imagine, and that's my point about all of these things that happened in the 20th century. Soviet atheism is another good example. You know, this is one of the famous, the famous examples of a state that decided to make atheism its core doctrine and its core worldview, and it, it was among the most 
brutal and savage nation states in history and it, the mass extermination of of its rivals and of its undesirables i, I believe it it far exceeds that of Nazi Germany, in fact. So that's, that's something to take into account. Now, the liberal democracies like Britain, like America, whatever, they are immune to a lot of these things, and, and there's a correlation with, with them not participating in all these kind of savage, extravagant brutalities uh, in a certain sense because they are not, because they, they retain a lot of the the ethos of the Christian values from the previous Christian era. But the United States, as I said, still develops the atom bomb and still, still kind of eradicates millions of civilians. And we justify that. We say, oh, we had to. Otherwise, more people would have died because blah, blah, blah. And, and there's, there's sort of a justification there that as a little too cavalier, at least for my comfort level, when we're talking about trying to take seriously radical human dignity. You don't just wipe out a whole city of civilians by pushing a button. That's something that is on our hands that I think we should take more seriously in terms of understanding what happens when the secular nation state uh, is able to act free of any religious constraints or any moral considerations other than achieving its own goals through power. Does that make sense? And of course, all of this is the collapse of the idea that we can have a purely rationalist project uh, that, that grounds morality. And I have another quote for you from, from David Bentley Hart. Part of the enthralling promise of an age of reason was, at least at first, the prospect of a genuinely rational ethics, not bound by local or tribal customs of this people or that, not limited to the moral precepts of any particular creed, but available to all reasoning minds, regardless of culture, and when recognized, immediately compelling to the rational will. That's a really good description of the Enlightenment moral project. This is what he says about it. Was there ever a more desperate fantasy than this? We live now in the wake of the most monstrously violent century in human history during which the secular order on both the political right and the political left, freed from the authority of religion, showed itself willing to kill on an unprecedented scale and with an ease of conscience worse than merely depraved. If ever an age deserved to be thought an age of darkness, it is surely ours. One might almost be tempted to conclude that secular government is the one form of government that has shown itself too violent capricious and unprincipled to be trusted. Now these are very strong words, but I think history backs that up for all the reasons that I've been saying. So with regard to the eugenics projects and all this kind of stuff, he says this also, the ambition to refashion humanity in its very essence, social, political, economic, moral, psychological, was inconceivable when human beings were regarded as creatures of God. But with the disappearance of the transcendent and of its lure and of its authority, it becomes possible to will a human future conform to whatever ideals we choose to embrace. This is why it is correct to say that the sheer ruthlessness of so much of post-Christian social idealism in some sense arises from the very same concept of freedom that lies at the heart of our most precious modern values. The savagery of triumphant Jacobianism, the clinical heartlessness of classical socialist eugenics, the Nazi movement, Stalinism, all the grand utopian projects of the modern age that have directly or indirectly spilled such oceans of human blood are no less results of the enlightenment myth of liberation than are the liberal democratic state or the vulgarity of late capitalist consumerism or the pettiness of bourgeois individualism. The most pitiless and self-righteously violent regimes of modern history in the West or in those quarters of the world contaminated by our worst ideas have been those that have most explicitly cast off the Christian vision of reality and sought to replace it with a more human set of values. No cause in history, no religion or imperial ambition or military adventure has destroyed more lives with more confident enthusiasm than the cause of the brotherhood of man, 
the post-religious utopia or the progress of the race. To fail to acknowledge this would be to mock the memory of all those millions that have perished before the advance of secular reason in its most extreme manifestations. And all the astonishing violence of the modern age, from the earliest European wars of the emergent nation-state onward, is no less proper an expression and measure of the modern story of human freedom than are the po various political and social movements that have produced the modern West's special combination of general liberty, material abundance, cultural mediocrity, and spiritual poverty. To, fa to fail to acknowledge this would be to close our eyes to the possibilities for evil that have been opened up in our history by the values we most dearly prize and by the truths we most fervently adore. So, very strong words, but I think justified. I think absolutely justified. And of course, all of this leads to the postmodern disillusionment. So, the promise was that reason could, and technology could save us and make a better world. The reality was that it made the world absolutely worse and in ways that are difficult to even imagine now. You know, you're sitting there in your comfy chairs and you can't imagine. Like, look up sometimes something about the conditions of the Holocaust, the, the, the Soviet gulags, the trench warfare. I mean, just, just the horrors that were, that were not just not just in scale, but in quality, you know, the ruthless scientific, scientific precision with which the Nazis uh, uh, eliminated people, the way that the Soviets tortured people into admitting false things and then putting them on trial and then, ah, see, you've admitted, you've admitted your guilt and now we will sentence you to death. Well, they tortured them beforehand to make them admit their guilt. So it's like just, just the quality of the things that happened. There's, there's, there's almost too many examples to even imagine, but they're all out there, and you can look them up on your own time. So, okay, that's bad. <laughs> that's bad. And then it leads to this disillusionment. So reason didn't get us there. So now, now I'm going to say distrust of reason, but really there's an abandonment of reason. So if, if the secular morality cast off Christian morality, then the postmodern... We, People call this postmodern. It's really late modernity. I think that's a better, that's a better phrase for it. So by the by the end of the modern period, towards which is where we're at now, there's a distrust even of reason and of science and technology because we all just saw it get destroyed or destroy the world. The world got destroyed by by reason serving a, 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 a genocidal use of science at the beginning at the behest of the nation state. And this is something we'll get into more later when we, when we sink into what's going on with modernity philosophically uh, in another lecture. So where are we at now? Well, the fundamental questions of modernity haven't been solved. They haven't been changed. We're still at the point where, where the, the state is the arbiter of, well, the state is supreme, basically, and it's still the arbiter for all value and, and power is still kind of the fundamental concern of the world. So reason is, is not really part of the conversation anymore. It's just about power, which is why you see today the way discourse happens. We can't dialogue with each other politically anymore. We have to, people are just trying to silence each other, tear each other down, destroy each other, remove each other, deplatform each other. I mean, these are not the actions of people who are interested in reasoning through things. These are the these aren't even the actions of people who believe in reason. They're the actions of a culture that has lost its faith in reason, lost its faith in religion, I'm pointing back to the board that has the medieval stuff on it. So there's no theology, there's no reason, there's no rationalism. All that's left is power. That's why we behave this way, and that's why, especially in this country, we can no longer talk politically anymore. There's no conversation to be had. We don't believe that a conversation will get us anywhere. We just need to destroy our enemies, which is a little microcosm of what happened in the 20th century with the nation states, right? They didn't come together and say, okay, let's collaborate on this. How can we, how can we work together and survive? No, they just decided to destroy each other. I mean, that's not, that's not clearly the only option in the world, right? Destroy your neighbors. There are other options. I can, I can think of others, right? So we're talking about power being the only thing left, and then we're also talking about 
kind of an inevitable part of this is when there's no universal, because remember, we're starting to get into this, uh, so no universal dignity. We are starting to get into this period where the, con the Christian concept of the person is fading. People no longer are endowed with radical human dignity. And that means there's going to be marginalization. Because why not? Not everyone is equally valuable. Because there's no way to ground or guarantee that these people, anybody's, intrinsic human dignity. We've gotten rid of the only, the only philosophy that said everybody had radical human dignity in the West. So there's no place to put it anymore. Which means there's always going to be a marginalization or a favoritization. And, and this is where you get, and this is another topic that we'll get into later, but this is where you get all these ideas of class guilt, right? So if you can say, well, this person belongs to this class of people, and we don't like that class of people, it doesn't matter what individual human dignity they have, we get rid of all of them. You know, this happened constantly in the 20th century. It's still kind of happening today. So in Nazi Germany, that was the Jews. In Stalinist Russia, that was anybody who, who they could identify as, as enemies of the state. That was kind of all religious authorities. They, they ruthlessly persecuted and executed priests, for example. Uh, in all the communist states that sprung up in the 20th century or communist movements, whenever they could identify somebody as bourgeois, meaning like the wealthy, privileged ruling class, regardless of their individual identity, and even almost regardless if that was true or not, uh, they would just kind of round up those people and, and, and slaughter them or put them in, in work camps or, or whatever. So as soon as you could identify somebody as not having value or, or not conforming to the values that you, as, as the sort of general culture of, of the secular state, decided were valuable, then you can marginalize those people. This happened constantly. I mean, people are, I'm bringing up these examples that are maybe the non-obvious examples to some of you, because obviously you can think about uh, the European enslavement of Africans as one. That's the one people want to talk about a lot, which they should. But what about when something that's overlooked, let's say, is, is the way that that's done on, under all these communist systems? Because if you can just identify somebody as like, oh, you're the wealthy, meaning maybe you own a couple cows and you can hire one or two people to help your work on your dairy farm and it's still a local mom and pop organization. You know, those people were identified as the wealthy ruling class. They absolutely weren't. But it was, that's enough for the communist intellectuals to kind of come in and, come in and, and round them all up and, and, and dispose of them. And that happened constantly. And that's something that people don't learn in school. And, and, and that's a really important feature of this because when you, it's, it's all related back to this, guys. When there's no grounding for universal dignity, there's no reason we just can't marginalize anyone we want out of hand. Which is why, again, it's so dangerous that the nation state is the sole arbiter for value and morality. Because values can only be by fiat or by consensus. They can't be intrinsic parts of reality, because we got rid of religion, remember? And consensus and fiat change. So you don't know. You're in the valued class today. Tomorrow you're in the undesirable class. You're shipped off to, to Soviet work camps, or whatever we come up with that's the equivalent. So. These are problems that we need to solve, and I don't have answers for them, but I just want you to understand how the world that we live in now is characterized by this movement through history of the rise and fall of Christian values in the West. They shaped the West in a certain way, and now we're in the deterioration of those values. And per universal human dignity and personhood, to me, is the main one that's deteriorating, that we have no way to, to guard and to hold on to, and is the cause of all of these atrocities that we see that would, would have been very different, wouldn't have happened this way in the medieval world. Couple things to keep you awake at night. The rise of big tech should be as troubling to you as the development of the atom bomb. Now, I know a lot of you weren't, none of you were alive in the 80s, but... Everyone was really scared of 
mutually assured destruction, meaning we had nukes, the Soviets had nukes. If we decided to nuke each other, it was the end. Like civilization was over. So that's an incredible power uh, of an incredibly high magnitude of possible destruction that, that we had and presumably still have. So that kept people up at night. That was scary. Uh, that's kind of been tabled for now. The new thing to me is, is big tech. So big tech is, and this is another conversation entirely, but read some studies about the way that social media affects your brain about dopamine addiction, about the way pornography affects the brain. So technology and the fact that everybody has a, basically a dopamine slot machine in their pockets, i.e. your smartphones, the, because of that dynamic going on, big tech, uh, intentionally or not, is changing the way human beings think. We're, our brains are very porous and are very, um, are very plastic. They're very shapeable. So, this technology is incredibly powerful because it can reshape how you think about the world. Read some of the studies on that. It's very terrifying. And of course, that's a power over the mind. So that's actually perhaps more scary than a power to destroy, to level cities, but to fundamentally, to fundamentally affect the brain in a way that maybe opens it up to kind of a, a fundamental reprogramming is is something that you should at least think about a little bit, right? So in conclusion, it's not clear where we're headed. We could be headed for a very bad place uh, with all the new opportunities for technology that we've discussed. We could do an about face and, and go in another much better direction. Lots of people are starting to be concerned. There's a growing concern with the power of technology and the effects it has on our brains, and that's good. We might pull back from the brink. We might not. It's not clear. So what the answer is to all of this, I don't know, but modernity's playing itself out now and we're we're in a we're in a kind of a crossroads of culture this is the crisis of modernity there's this decline of the value of the human person the person the concept of the person that that robust thing that has universal human dignity uh, there's no grounding for it in this paradigm and so it's in danger right now and all of these kind of little moralistic movements about, you know, this group or that group or whatever, those aren't going to help because they're not about universal human dignity. None of these kind of racial, or ethnic, cultural, or identity-oriented groups can give us universal human dignity anymore. They actually just do the opposite. They fractionate us into more and more groups. So... I don't know where we go from here. I hope it's a good place, but we're going to need some kind of intellectual or spiritual revival in order to really look at our past as a culture, as Western civilization, in an honest and authentic way, engage our history, and try to come up with something that gets us in a good direction and not a very bad one, because the 20th century was bad, and I hope the 21st century is better, but it may not be. It may not be. So, not to end on a downer, of course, but there are things that are worth losing sleep over, and it's important that you go through life understanding why we're in the position culturally, socially, politically, etc., why we're in the position we're in. And now you know something of that conversation, and I hope that you can be armed with that and take it into conversation in the world and help the world move in a better direction and not a repeat, repeating the 20th century. So continue the conversation, and, and we will continue it. <laughs>